Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome back to part two of our fourth lecture. Uh, up to now, we have sort of mastered Newton's law of gravity, Newton's laws of motion. We learned about um, the improvement to Kepler's laws that Newton came up with. We learned about escape velocity. We also did a little kids module on momentum and angular momentum. Today, we continue pushing forward into what is chapter five of the book, which deals with a couple of different things. It deals with a quick recap on how atoms and molecules work. And then the more important issue is to learn every possible thing that we can about light. Gravity and orbits are obviously really important for astronomy because everything is whizzing around the galaxy and planets are whizzing around stars. Uh, but ultimately we astronomers can only learn information about space through one of these bad boys here. We don't get to go out and unfortunately, they haven't built me a Millennium Falcon yet so I can travel around the galaxy. I'm still waiting for that. Uh, but until they do, I've got to use this telescope to capture photons from space. So everything we know about stars comes from our ability to mine light for information. And you wouldn't believe this, but light contains so much encoded information. Just like you can study DNA to learn about the <clears throat> biological functions of an organism, you can study light to learn about the functions of stars. Um, light is of course a form of energy. And that means today we will start by talking about energy. Energy actually is a concept that comes from Newton's laws of motion, from ideas about force, and, uh, and distance and other things like that. So let's start today by looking at a couple of pictures and then we'll define some things for you guys. Let's pop over to slide 34. Um, <clears throat> I used Newton's cradle as a demonstration of momentum in our last class, but I can also use it as a demonstration of energy. Um, energy takes various forms. It's kind of like a, shape-shifting protein ghost that can rear its head in different formats that you're not expecting. Uh, like momentum, the old-timey scientists actually used to think of energy as a kind of fluid that can be poured from one vessel into another, and that's because of its ghost-like properties. But really, energy is an abstract concept, which you have to work really hard at first to think about. But if you define energy carefully, you can actually gain a lot of physical insight into mechanical systems. You kind of get supernatural x-ray vision to, to see how things work. Let's start off with the fundamental definition of energy. It's so subtle, it's so sublime, that it's actually not really helpful for you at this stage in your development. The basic, most generic definition of energy is that it is a force multiplied through a distance. And that almost sounds kind of stupid at first. Like imagine you've got some block, okay? And you know you have to push on a block if you want it to move. And so you, you apply a, a force through some distance and somehow that is considered energy. Um, sometimes people refer to energy by another term, they call it work because of energy's ability to do things like power a machine or an amplifier or something. So in fact, we're going to write that down for completeness, and then we're going to transition into better forms of energy that you can understand. So let's start here. Energy. The fundamental definition is that energy is a force multiplied by a distance. Apply a force across a distance and you've, you've used or created energy. Um, once again, I'll mention that currently, not helpful to you. So let's start by considering some other aspects of energy. Energy takes various forms. And although the forms are, are, are very greatly varied, they kind of fall into one of three different classes. 
One form that energy can take is the form of what we call potential energies. Potential energies are usually energies that are stored in some kind of a system. It's like a stored or contained energy that you can then unleash on your enemies, okay? Um, then there are kinetic energies. Kinetic energies are usually associated with moving objects. It's more like released energy. And there is a third or fourth form, light. Light is a pure form of energy that has aspects of potential energy and aspects of kinetic energy, but it's kind of its own thing. And here's what's even more effed up. Once Einstein gave us E equals MC squared, it turns out that even matter is a form of energy. But I dare not even write that down right now because it's too confusing. You have to kind of build up pieces before you're ready to really digest that. So I could include matter here, but I, I'm too afraid to do that. So light is just a pure form of energy. Here's something else that's cool about energy. Energy, you'll remember that when we talked about momentum, I said that it was a conserved quantity, meaning the total momentum in a box is constant. Same is true with energy. Energy is a conserved quantity. meaning the total energy of a system, and the system could be the entire universe, it could be the molecules in your oven, it could be the, you know, the, 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 the liquid in a thermos, who knows. But the total energy in a closed system is always a constant. You've heard of that as the conservation of energy. That's what makes it so useful. It's more abstract to think about than a velocity or a force, but on the other hand, if you're willing to think about it, you can predict what happens when two things come in contact. You'll see more of that as we go. That makes it useful, okay? Okay, so here's why we're gonna run this. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about a, a type of potential energy called gravitational potential energy. And that's gonna give us some extra insight here. <clears throat> Is everyone caught up in the notes? Uh, Kiana, looks like you're writing. Oh, no, I'm caught up. I was just writing the date. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm going to erase unless anyone has an objection. Okay, let's take a peek at some potential energy together. And this type of potential energy is called gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is energy stored in a gravitational field. And the most basic generic setup is you have uh, the ground of Earth, okay? So this is the ground. You take some, some massive object like a one kilogram test mass, and then you lift it some height above the ground, I call the height H, and the gravitational potential energy stored in the gravitational field is the mass times little g times H. Let's make sure you guys remember what little g is. We, we talked about it last time, so I think somebody should. What's that little g all about, students? Tell me about little g. The force of gravity? I, I can't say that's true. It's not a force. So it's not the force of gravity. It's, I, I can't find the right word. Force is the only thing that I. Yeah, it's, 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 another, it's another quantity. But we need to find the right word. Because I, I cannot say it is related to gravity, but it is not a force. It's the local <laughs> acceleration of Earth's gravity. It's the local acceleration of Earth's gravity. It's unique to Earth. And what's the value, Mariah? What do you mean the value? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, G is, a, is like a letter. 
and yeah, I want the number in the units. Oh, okay, oh yeah, okay. So it's ten um, meters per second squared. So little g, 10 meters per second squared, will remind ourselves, since we needed a reminding, is the local acceleration of Earth. Local acceleration of Earth's gravity, whatever. Um, okay, so then let's make some energy, shall we? Here's a one kilogram test mass, okay? Um, I don't know. Here's a couple of meters. I've got, you can't see it, but I've got two meter sticks stacked on top of each other there, right? Okay. So let's start off by, by putting this one kilogram mass on the ground. Let's see, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I had some pizza, pizza for breakfast, okay? And I gave my my, my muscles, some pizza energy. And now I'm ready to make some gravitational potential energy out of pizza. So um, the, the pizza, the energy is flowing from the pizza into my muscles and it's about to do magic here, ready? And I'm lifting this one kilogram test mass, boom. And somehow by fighting against the forces of gravity, by fighting against the pull of gravity, gravity wants to rip this to the ground and I'm fighting in the other direction, pushing up against it, I have now stored some gravitational potential energy. And I can do things, I can do work with this potential energy. I can take this one kilogram test mass over to a small village somewhere and I can release it on the heads of the unsuspecting villagers, releasing potential energy against those poor, innocent, defenseless villagers, okay? I could drop this right on their heads. Now, where is that energy being stored anyways? Where's the energy hiding? This is the hard thing. Energy is like an abstract thing to see with your eyes. A push we can kind of understand and you know, velocities we've traveled in our cars, but what about this energy? Where, where's the energy hiding? What do you think it's hiding? Energy is hiding. Um, hmm. Do you understand the question? In Maybe the mass exactly. of whatever you're holding? It's so it's not exactly in the mass by itself. That's what I was wanting to address. It's like the energy couldn't be said to be there. It's kind of, it's more complicated. It's in the entire system. It's in the system of it requires all three parts for the energy to be there. It's the mass plus the gravity ground of Earth plus the separation between the two. Let me tell you about another form of potential energy. Um, in your basic physics class, you always spend a lot of time talking about springs. Springs are the equivalent of uh, wax uh, painting the fence in the Karate Kid. You start off doing something boring, talking about springs, but they can be applied to a lot of different systems. And with a spring, a spring has a natural resting state, an equilibrium state. And it turns out that if you stretch a spring, the spring will experience a restoring force that wants to snap it back into place. And usually the rule is, they call it Hooke's law, the more you stretch, the greater the force that snaps it back. Um, the force that wants to snap it back is contained within all the coils of the spring. The fact that all of those molecules of metal want to, to sort of twist back into a relaxed state is what provides the force. So if you stretch a spring, but you keep it stretched, you are storing potential energy. Now, this is not gravitational potential energy because it's not gravi gravity that's trying to create the force. It's the intermolecular forces, which is ultimately an electromagnetic force. So you might even call this electromagnetic potential energy. And when I release this, actually they would probably call it electromechanical is how people would say it because there's a dimension of my hand stretching this. So it's electromechanical. So when I release my hands, so the energy is stored in a way in all the coils of the spring wanting to snap it back. 
in a weird way, this one kilogram mass is kind of like stretching a spring, right? Because in the same way, gravity wants to pull it back and snap it back to Earth. The problem is because gravity is invisible, the energy is invisible, but it's, it requires, just like I need all parts of this spring to want to snap back, I need the mass plus the Earth plus the space in between. So it's kind of like some, some it's some big, it's the whole system. Really. Um, why don't we calculate a potential energy to see what its units are? That'll give us some extra insight. So in the example problem, I took a one kilogram test mass. I guess you can't really see it because of the glare. That's one kilogram. I lifted it up two meters and we know big G. So let's find our, our units of potential energy. Potential energy is the mass, one kilogram. Actually, I'm gonna do the units in a different color so they kind of pop out a little bit more. So we have one kilogram times 10 meters per second squared times two meters. And, uh, sorry, I wanna make that neat. One times 10 times two gives us 20. Okay, guys, you tell me what the units are. Jewels. Well, we're going to get there, Andy, but first I want to know in MKS units. I oh, mean, meters, second, uh, second square? Not meters, it? second square. That would not be how we say that. It would be um, kilograms times meter to the second. Yes. Divided by the second square. Uh, seconds to the second power. Very good. So a kilogram times a meter squared divided by a second squared. Nicely done. So we have kilogram times meters squared divided by second squared. In fact, they're almost the same as units of force, but different by one extra meter. Now, as Andrew just hinted, it gets annoying to constantly say kilogram meters squared per second squared. It's kind of a mouthful. So what we do is we invent a new unit to kind of put all of this into a box. And we call that unit the joule. The joule is equivalent to a kilogram meters squared per second squared. And that means you can think of joule as basically an MKS unit. All right, I'm going to erase just a second here. We good? I'm going to erase. Before I talk about kinetic energies, Let's take a look at some different units of energy so that you'll be able to realize when we're measuring it in our everyday lives. So let's talk about various units of energy. Um, we have the joule. One joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And as I mentioned, that's the MKS unit system. Um, when you pay your gas bill, you often, um, you, if you look at the gas meter, it's, they measure it in therms. I think therms are British thermal units. That's how they rate air conditioners and, and like heaters and things. You know, I think I, I learned this the other day and now I've forgotten it. Uh, are therms the, the same thing as a British thermal unit? Um, unit therms 
to be to you. Okay, so it looks like a therm is 10, wait, what is this? Oh, wow, it's basically 100,000 BTUs. Okay, so that's right. I used to think that therms were the same as BTUs, but they're not the same. So when you pay your gas bill, one therm is 100,000. They call them British thermal units. If you have to buy an air conditioner from, uh, I was gonna say Benny's, but that's not cool. Job lot, if you go to job lot to buy an air conditioner, they'll tell you how many BTUs of energy it, it, it uses or absorbs. Uh, when you pay your electric bill, this might come up in our homework uh, today, actually. Um, we, we use a unit called the kilowatt hour. Kilowatt times one hour. And a kilowatt hour is just another, another unit of energy. I can't remember what it's equivalent to. I think that's gonna be our homework problem to figure out how many joules is in a kilowatt hour. Um, how, about the, um, how about the imperial British units? That's the one that the US system uses. Do you guys know what the imperial British unit of energy is? You've actually heard of it before, but you might not have thought of it as being an energy. One calorie. Very good. So there are different types of calories. There's the, the original calorie, which is lowercase c, is 4.2 joules. And it's a pretty small unit of energy. I forget how they defined it, but it's something like the amount of energy needed to raise one cubic centimeter of water by one degree Celsius or something like that. So it's a pretty small amount of energy. Uh, but the calories that you use in food are actually kilocalories, which are 4,200 joules. For some reason, some governmental body like the FDA or something has decided that kilocalories would be too confusing for the average American consumer and that we wouldn't want to use the kilo thing because that sounds confusing. And for some hideously evil reason, they have renamed the kilocalorie, the calorie with a capital C, leading to immense confusion between the real calorie and the food calorie. Um, so don't ask me why they do that. One thing that I'm trying to imply here, besides telling you about different units of energy, is to show you that energy can be stored in different ways. You can measure the energy of gas that you use or the energy of the electric current that powers your Nintendo, or you could measure uh, energy in terms of food too. Let's find out how much energy I had for breakfast this morning, okay? I wonder if we could look up the number of calories in one slice of barbecue chicken pizza. Let's try to do that and see what happens. Uh, uh, calories in a slice of, I wanna actually look up, bar, I suspect barbecue chicken pizza has more calories than say a slice of cheese. Okay, 390 calories. A large barbecue chicken pizza slice. They say 390, which is, I thought it was gonna be higher than that, but okay. I did eat two pieces actually. So <laughs> let's say, let's find out how many calories and how many joules I can see. Uh, I'm gonna erase this. Okay, so how many joules did I eat today? Okay, let's play this game. How many joules did I eat today? So I had two slices of barbecue chicken pizza for a total energy content of two times, well, was it 390 or was it 290? I'm forgetting already. Maybe I have wishful thinking here. 390. Yeah, it was 390. Is this? I've got it coming here. 390. And that's food calories, right? So someone punched that up for me. That's 600, 780, is that right? Arithmetic isn't my strong suit. 
780. 780 says the peanut gallery over there is laughing at my barbecue chicken consumption. Okay. <laughs> All right. And let's convert that to joules. This sounds like a job for Mateus. Mateus, can you use your excellent skills of dimensional analysis and help me convert 780 calories into joules? Sure. Okay. How should we begin? You're muted. I know. I'm thinking. I'm talking to myself. Oh, um, <laughs> you can just use your steps of dimensional analysis if you need to guide yourself. So if you have those notes with the four steps of dimensional analysis, they can guide you. All right. So we're going to write the, the units first. Uh, no, that's not what step one says. Just open it up. You have your notebook handy, right? I do, but I don't have the 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 step by step part because I usually do it in my head. Well, how's that working for you? Um, in the in the did general problems, it works did out. I give you you didn't think? no, you didn't. I don't ever remember giving you permission to think. I know better than to do that. I gave you permission to do one thing, which is use the four steps of dimensional analysis because that always works. You cannot trade methods that work for methods that do not work. Thinking doesn't work, okay? I'm sorry. So what's the first step? Someone remind Mateus. Mateus, you should know better. How dare you not write something down that I write on the board? You have to write down everything. That, and if I put a star next to it, you better put a star next to it. That means I'm gonna need you to read that from time to time. Um, someone's got another first step. What is it? It's write down the number to convert to it with its units. Okay, Mateus, you're not off the hook. What number should I write down with its units? All right, so I, I actually don't have the, 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 the difference from calories to uh, no, no, no. joules. Cause... Don't, look, could you just not get ahead of yourself here? I just want you to do okay. step one. If you do step one, that would make me happy. Got it. All right, so we're going to do uh, 780 calories, right? Okay. Okay, what's step two? Once again, you're not allowed to think. You're allowed to use the four steps of dimensional analysis. It's multiply by a division bar. One. We'll do that one for you, Mateus. Now, Mateus, sorry. you're telling me that you don't have a conversion from calories to joules, which I find kind of outrageous, seeing as the very last note that I put on the board was the conversion from calories to joules. So. Are you, let me ask you this question, Mateus. Are you writing anything down? I have, I have this down. Is this? Is that what like, we just, hold it up here? Am I missing something? Yeah, hold it up a little closer. Oh, let me open my camera so I can see it. Yeah, no, you are missing something. It's right there. Look right after food. What does it say? All right, uh, one kilocalorie. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm really right? sorry. Right, okay, all right. All right, we're talking yes, now. Right. So now, hold on, just slow your, slow your moves, Mateus. Units top and bottom. That's okay, it. so on, okay, so on top, we're gonna do uh, joules. Okay. Oh my God, no, I'm totally over my head. Um. No, this is the easiest part. You put on the bottom. Wow, we should have called on you a long time ago, Mateus. Uh, you know what? From I now know. on, I vote I'm Mateus not on my best our day national today, my dimensional. Defense. Mateus is now our national dimensional analysis expert, and he will be called on again and again to do conversions. I'm going to have some love fun it. with you. All right, you've got to figure out what units to put on the bottom, Mateus. Okay, so on the bottom, we're going to do calories. You have to. You always know what's on the bottom has to be what's up here. Yeah, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, good. So now we've canceled our calories. Now you need a conversion factor. You need some numbers. So tell me what yes. the numbers are. All right, so one calorie is gonna be 4.2 joules. Ah, you've been bamboozled by the FDA. The FDA has befuddled your wits because you have confused that's the imperial calories one. Yes, you're right. calories. How could you confuse calories with calories? One calorie lowercase c is 4.2 joules, but this calorie, barbecue chicken uh, calorie, is a kilocalorie. So what's the conversion from kilocalories to joules? So it's gonna be 4,200. And where does the 4,200 go? On top. Good. And what goes on the bottom? 
one. Well, yeah, one one kilocalories, forty two hundred. Yeah. Okay, punch him up. Two slices of barbecue chicken za. Okay, <laughs> I had some za this morning. <laughs> so, uh, three million two hundred and seventy six thousand. Holy jumping Jesus. 3,276. So 3.28 million joules. Shit. Now, suppose I wanted to work off those two slices of, I was actually thinking about eating a third slice. I had to restrain myself, okay? Now let's say, let's say I were to try to burn off those za with some exercise appropriate for a wimpy astronomer, okay? I want to introduce to you an exercise known as the one kilogram squat. I'm going to put this thing down on the ground and I'm going to go, and I'm going to pump it two meters over my head. How many joules does it cost me to do a one kilogram squat? So let's invent a new unit of energy related to the exercise that I call the kilogram squat. How many joules does it cost to do one kilogram squat? Why would you know that? Because we calculated it five minutes ago. 20 joules. Very good, Andrew. And so now I want to answer this question. How many one kilogram squats must I do to repent from this morning's za? Okay. How many one kilogram squats must I do to repent from the za? How would, how would I calculate that? <clears throat> By dividing uh, the 3.28 times 10 to the six by 20. Yeah, and let's do a dimensional analysis style. We would start with 3.28 million joules. And we're actually gonna think of it as a unit conversion. We're gonna convert from units of joules to units of kilogram squats. And just like Mateus said, one kilogram squat is 20 joules. One hundred and sixty-four thousand. Sorry. One hundred and sixty-four thousand. Holy shit! One hundred and sixty-four thousand squats. Can someone else confirm that? Whew. Oh my goodness! I'm in trouble. I have done bad. Let's say I could do one squat per second. 164,000 seconds divided by 60 that would be tw that would be 2700 minutes divided by 60 minutes that would take me 45 hours of squats just to burn off <laughs> one two slices of pizza and this my friends is why i probably shouldn't have pizza for breakfast right <laughs> There is a lot of energy in food. This is what makes us um, struggle. This is what gives us the COVID-19, as they say, you know, or the, the COVID-15, whatever they call it. <laughs> We're all sitting around in our apartments, stress eating, <laughs> because, or eating out of boredom. <laughs> And we're all going to need a good run after uh, once the snow melts. <laughs> OK, so that's, sorry, that's a lot of squats, obviously. And you know, obviously I don't have to burn all of those off. It costs energy just to maintain your heartbeat and to maintain a temperature gradient with your environment. Thinking uses energy. And I, I probably burn more than 20 joules just jumping up and down because obviously, unfortunately, I weigh a lot more than one kilogram. You know, I'm probably about 90 to 100 kilograms at this point. Um, okay, but still, it takes a lot of work to use up the energy that you have in food. 
energy can be transferred from one form to another. It can go from za to your muscles, to lifting up blocks and levers in the ground. There's also an energy that's associated with moving objects. Let's do a quick tidbit on that. Um, I'm going to erase. Everyone cool here? You got all that? All right. So this is a quick formula that we probably won't do a sample problem with, but we need to talk about it. It's called uh, kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is the energy uh, associated, the energy of a moving object. More technically speaking, it's the energy you need to accelerate an object to a particular velocity. Usually you have something like a, a cannonball or something with mass, and it's traveling through space with some velocity. And then we just simply define the kinetic energy as one half mass times velocity squared. So for instance, if you wanted to calculate the energy of a bullet, um, bullets travel close to the speed of sound and bullets have masses of a few hundred grams. Um, it depends upon the gun, of course, but let's just look up the mass of a generic bullet. Um, they're saying somewhere between 0 0.02 kilograms and 0 0.04 kilograms. Well, so that's what, uh, one, two, three, 20 grams, huh? I would have thought, oh, wow. Okay, so something here isn't making sense um, to me. That's in grains, not uh, grams. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Welcome. Sorry about that. Okay, I was because that conversion didn't make sense to me. So let's go with 0 0.02 kilograms, and then we'll grab the speed of a bullet. These are numbers I should probably know, but uh, oh, I don't want. Uh, I don't. I want it in meters per second. Uh, okay. Wow, why are they giving to you in miles per hour? Speed of a bullet, meters per second. I've looked this up before. I don't know why I can't, I can never remember this number. Okay, so 500, and, let's say 550 meters per second. We'll just take two random numbers, okay? So if we wanted to ask, I, I said I wasn't gonna do a calculation, but I, I remember at one point I wanted to know how many joules a typical bullet delivers. If we had a mass of 0 0.02 kilograms and let's say a velocity of 550 meters per second, that sounds pretty fast to me, but I don't know. What do I know about bullets? Uh, what's the, what do we have for a typical, don't forget to square it. Can you guys punch that up for me real quick? This should be a wicked simple calculation, right? Geez, guys, I could do it in my sleep before you guys finish. You slow. 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.02 times 550 hit the square key equals 3,000 joules. <clears throat> um. Compare that to the, 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 the one kilogram squat, and you realize that bullets have a, uh, a very, very powerful destructive, uh, release a destructive amount of energy. There's this, uh, of course, a famous image taken by, I think it was Doc Edgerton. I usually have this in my slideshow because I think it's just very beautiful. Uh, 
uh, where is this here? Do I have a, oh yeah. Doc, Doc Edgerton using uh, strobe photography took this, this is like a piece of art as well as, as some science here. And it's just captured the moment a bullet has ruptured through an apple, just exploding the, the flesh of the fruit. It's just pretty wild to look at that. So there's energy associated with moving objects as well as stored energies. And you can do different kinds of things with these energies. You can transform one type of energy into another. I could take the kinetic energy of some moving water molecules, use it to turn this turbine here, and I could generate and store some electricity, which could later power uh, the lights in my house. What a cool and clever use of nature's free energy to power the electricity of my house. I like that. We're going to talk about light eventually, but um, energy can also be used to understand differences between things like temperature and heat. And that's a discussion that, uh, that we'd like to have together, because when we talk about atoms and we talk about light, it turns out that temperature is connected to those things. So let's have a, a quick module on the difference between temperature and uh, heat. And I'm going to do this one a little quicker today because I've got a lot of places to go. Um, people often interchange these two words. but they are not exactly the same thing. Let's start by defining heat. Heat is a transfer of energy, a transfer of energy from, oops, sorry, from something from point A to point B. And A and B could be almost anything. If you had some whiskey on the rocks, it could be energy from the whiskey being transferred into the ice cubes. Um, if you're heating up your pizza in the toaster oven, the energy is going from the toaster oven into the za, right? It turns out that there's, uh, by the way, because it's a transfer of energy, it has the same units as energy. It's measured in joules because you're transporting joules from one thing to another. Now, despite the almost infinite number of ways that you can store energy, there's actually only three ways to transfer energy. And these are known as the three modes of heat transport or the three types of energy transport. Since I want us to think of heat and energy as the same thing, I'm going to call them the three modes or the three forms of energy transport. They are convection, conduction, and radiation. And as we go forward in this class, I'm gonna actually need you guys to understand the differences between these things and know when energy is being transported by convection, when by conduction and radiation. I'll get to that in a little bit. Let's first move on and talk about temperature, okay? <clears throat> to understand the definition of temperature and why it's different, you need to be able to, um, to understand a little bit about, uh, you need to be able to look at a microscopic picture of, of a gas at work. So let's call up a crappy little animation that I have here. Uh, I think it's in my next slideshow. Let's look at uh, what the gas molecules in your oven are doing when you're heating up your pizza. Whoops. Uh, I've got a little animation here, not a great one, but one that will do, slide 22. And these little BBs that you see bouncing around in a box could represent the air molecules inside of an oven when you're heating up pizza. Air is made up of basically three parts nitrogen, to one part oxygen. So you might imagine that the little blue pellets are molecules of nitrogen and the little red pellets are mo uh, molecules of oxygen, but they actually, uh, they're about the same size and mass. They're close to each other anyways. So these, these particles are all kind of bouncing around in a box and they basically behave just like pool balls on a pool table. They kind of travel in a straight line until they smash into one of their neighbors 
And when they smash into one of their neighbors, they reflect off each other in a very logical way. This is just like uh, breaking up a, you know, a rack uh, set of pool balls. And um, if you try to track any one of the, of the BBs here, you can see that as it collides with its neighbors, it's constantly changing its velocity. Sometimes it moves fast, sometimes it moves slow, sometimes it moves in between. But because of the conservation of energy and because of the conservation of momentum, every time one of these little particles crashes into another one, if it slows down, the particle that it hit has to speed up by an appropriate amount. And so even though the individual speeds and therefore the individual kinetic energies are constantly changing, the ensemble of particles, the whole collection of BBs, they have to have a kind of conserved average energy or an average velocity. And the only type of energy that I can see here is kinetic energy, because these are just faceless little ping pong balls bouncing off of each other. So I can see the energy of motion, but I don't really see any stored energy here. And, and this collective kinetic energy is what we define as temperature, okay? So temperature is the average, whoa, spelling. The average kinetic energy of a system of particles. I hope you can read that. The average kinetic energy of a system of particles. And that system of particles could be the molecules of gas in a box or a liquid or a solid, whatever. <clears throat> now, it turns out that you don't actually have to, to measure all of the speeds of the particles and then calculate their kinetic energies and divide by 10 bazillion to get the, the temperature of a substance rather than try to measure temperature by measuring the speeds of all the part oh, in fact let's say this because kinetic energy because kinetic energy is one half mv squared usually the masses of the molecules are fixed but their velocities change so here's a useful lie a useful lie which is not true but is almost better than the truth is that you can think of temperature as being kind of like the speed of the particles. I would never lie to you and tell you that that's true, but it's, it's the way I think about it, and it's maybe better for you to think about it that way too. Obviously, we can't measure the speeds of every single gas particle in an oven because it would take too long and it's hard to kind of look at them anyways. Instead, all we have to do is find some kind of a substance that will change with temperature and then put some tick marks on it and bam, you've got a thermometer. And there are different scales that we can use to measure temperature. You guys are familiar with the Fahrenheit system in Europe and basically everywhere else in the world, they use Celsius. Scientists use a temperature scale that's almost identical to Celsius, it's called Kelvin. And that's the one that we're going to use in this class, Kelvin. I thought that maybe what I could do is have us recreate a temperature chart, just so you can see how some temperatures that you know and love in Fahrenheit kind of convert to some useful temperatures in Celsius and Fahrenheit. I think this is a, a nice chart to have. So let's kind of take out our rulers and make a quick temperature chart, quick and dirty. Okay, I'm going to have four columns here. One, two, three, four. And um, the first row will be the substance. Then we're going to do degrees Fahrenheit degrees Celsius. And you might think of the point of this as introducing the Kelvin system for anyone who's not familiar with it. So 
So let's do boiling water. Let's do a typical human body, the internal temperature of a human body. Uh, we will do room temperature. And we'll do freezing temperature of water. I'm pretty sure everyone in this class knows the temperature in Fahrenheit at which water freezes, right? Shout at me, what is it? 32. 32 degrees. How about boiling water in the Fahrenheit system? Do you know that? I know in Celsius. What is it in Celsius? 40. No. No, it isn't. It's 100 in Celsius. Yeah. Isn't that funny how everyone knows the boiling temperature of water in Celsius, but not in Fahrenheit? You know the freezing temperature of water in Celsius, right? Zero. Yeah. That's the idea is that Celsius is just all based on water, so it's easier to remember and easier to use. In the Fahrenheit system, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. A human body is about 99 degrees Fahrenheit. And room temperature uh, for most people is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. In the Celsius system, oh, I'm so bad at this. I think room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. And a human body is like 37 degrees Celsius. I think, I think I got that. Let's just double check my memory here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, because temperature measures something like the speeds of the particles. Temperature is always conceptually a positive quantity because if you think about it, as you cool a gas down, the gas particles should move slower and slower and slower. And when you get to the end, when the particles move so slowly that they finally stop, that should be the sort of bottom out point where all temperature stops. And it turns out if you measure this, this quantity is called absolute zero. An absolute zero, the lowest temperature that you can put any substance, has a measurable value of negative 273 degrees Celsius. In Fahrenheit, it's negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the lowest temperature you can make any substance before all the gas particles kind of come to a halt. In theory, nature doesn't actually let you get there. It gets really angry at you when you try to cool something off that much. But we have actually, in a laboratory, used lasers to cool gas particles down to one ten billionth of a degree Celsius of absolute zero. So we've gotten wicked close to it. In fact, nature changes its phase of matter at that point, and it becomes a weird substance called a Bose-Einstein condensate. I ain't got time to tell you about the Bose-Einstein condensate, but let me tell you, it's nutty stuff. The idea that Lord Kelvin had is that Celsius was a pretty damn good temperature scale, but he didn't like the idea that you had negative temperatures and positive temperatures when temperature is always about speeding up particles from absolute zero. So he declared absolute zero to be zero Kelvin and then measured upwards in exactly the same increments as Celsius. So uh, 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. 373 Kelvin is the boiling point of water. Human bodies are about 310. And room temperature, I think, is 273 Kelvin. <laughs> hey, Jordan, would you mind turning the temperature down to like 71? Speaking of temperature, I'm starting to heat up here. 71 degrees Fahrenheit, that is. Okay. <laughs> um, you guys got this? This is just a nice little chart. Yeah, there's formulas to convert back and forth, but I'd rather you guys just have a touchy-feely sense of what some common everyday temperatures are like. Mostly, we're going to be measuring pretty wacky temperatures. We're either, either going to be measuring the temperatures of gas particles in space, which are usually like down near zero Kelvin, or we're gonna be measuring the temperatures of stars, which are like 
thousands and thousands of degrees Kelvin. So we're not gonna be dealing with your everyday temperatures in this class. We're gonna be dealing with some wacky stuff. Uh, Natalie may have just schooled me. Natalie, you might be right. Did I, did I do that wrong? Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, 293 Kelvin. Jeez, thank, what did I write down? Oh my gosh, yes, yes. Natalie, thank you for catching me on that. Oh. I saw that, but I didn't know if you were right or wrong because I'm bad at math, so I just didn't want to say anything because well, for I, all I, just, I know that was right. <laughs> I, I'm not used to thinking about room temperature in Kelvin. So Natalie, I'm so glad you caught that. Uh, Natalie, I actually meant to check, fact check myself because I was feeling uncertain about that, but then I started to feel hot and I asked Jordan to turn the temperature down. So, all right. Thanks, Natalie, for catching that. Uh, yes, always, always call my bullshit, Kiana, because I occasionally do get my numbers wrong, okay? Got you. Thanks, Natalie. I'm glad to know them trolls are watching in the background. Okay, um, uh, I need to erase this now that we've created it. Is that okay? Here we go. Okay, we're almost at the point where I can talk about all of our homework today is going to be based on atoms and light. So I kind of need to get to that before our class ends today. So all of this was kind of background for, for what we really need. Um, we really need to do a little module on atoms and we really need to do a little module on light. Let me check my time here. 102, I'm totally screwed. Okay, so let's do this as quick as we can. Um, let's talk about some basic ideas about atoms. We're going to make a Bohr model of the atom. And to make this useful, let's start with the second most abundant atom in space, uh, which is an atom of helium, all right? Helium as an atom has two protons. So let's use uh, little positively charged BBs for protons. And it has two neutrons. So I'll use two neutral BBs for neutrons. And they are part of the nucleus of an atom. And then there are electrons which orbit around it. There's two electrons. I'm not sure I do this atom so good. Okay, so uh, just in case you didn't know this, these are the electrons. Uh, these are the protons, and these are the neutrons. This, of course, is the nucleus of the atom. And because protons and neutrons both make up the nucleus, we refer to protons and neutrons as nucleons. When I want to talk about protons and neutrons collectively, and I don't feel like saying protons and neutrons, I can say nucleons instead. Um, in the Bohr model of the atom, the electrons are kind of orbiting around the nucleus, just like planets orbit around the sun, right? Uh, what makes the electrons orbit the nucleus? Do you got, well, suppose I said, what makes Earth orbit the sun? What would you say the answer to that question was? Why does Earth orbit the sun? The simple answer would be gravity. Right. Okay. So what if I said the same thing for atoms, Kiana? Why do the electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom? Is it also gravity? Is it polarity? Uh, it's related to the pluses and minuses, but we don't call that polarity. Well, not usually. It's the force of electromagnetism. Let's take that as a note. Atoms are held together by electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is a fu fundamental force of nature, just like gravity but it governs the world of positive and negatively charged particles. It actually holds, sort of holds atoms together, <clears throat> not entirely, but sort of. Um, 
it turns out that electromagnetism is also the basis of light as well. How does electromagnetism work? There are two rules for electromagnetism. The first rule is um, like charges repel. So two protons push apart, two elect. In fact, you know how electromagnetism works if you've ever played around with frig fridge magnets. They're governed by the same force, but they're a little different, but they kind of feel the same. So if I have two protons and I push them against each other, I experience a force almost identical to what happens if you push two north poles of a magnet together. They don't actually, they repel one another. Um, pluses and minuses behave like the north and south side of a magnet. They want to stick together, right? So like charges repel and opposites attract. It's often pointed out that electromagnetism is way more complicated than gravity because it has two rules. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract. In gravity, there's one rule. All masses want to stick together. Everything attracts. So gravity tends to be a bit simpler than electromagnetism. The positive charge and the negative charge of the protons and electrons they are the carriers of electromagnetism. Charge is to electromagnetism in the same respect that mass is to gravity. We think of mass as being the cause of gravity. So the pluses and minuses are the kind of cause of electromagnetism. Okay, now I need to introduce some quick rules for atoms, just some shitty little vocab terms that you need to know before we go forward. So I'm gonna erase this little bit here. Oh, I still need that. All right, Andrew, let me know when you're done. I'll sip the iced tea. Got it. All right. I'll leave this picture of an atom up. Okay, and I wanted to find a couple of quick vocab terms. The first vocab term I'll call capital A. It's the atomic number. The atomic number of an atom tells you the number of protons in the nucleus. The importance about the atomic number is that the in the atomic number defines the atom or the element. When we add and subtract neutrons and electrons from an atom, it can start to get confusing which atom you're talking about. By defining your atom as the number of protons, you always know whether you're talking about hydrogen or helium or mercury or neon or whatever. Uh, the next term is the mass number, capital M. The mass number is the number of nucleons in your atom, which basically means it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. The importance of the mass number, in addition to sort of defining the mass of the atom, even more importantly, the mass number defines the isotope of the atom. What's the isotope? The isotope is same number of protons, different number of neutrons. I hope you guys can read that. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. <clears throat> 
usually because electromagnetism is wicked, wicked powerful, the number of protons will be equal to the number of electrons in your typical atom. In other words, most atoms are most atoms are electrically neutral. Electrically neutral means same number of protons equal to the number of electrons. You will discover that from time to time, nature is capable of taking electrons away from an atom or pushing extra electrons onto an atom. When that happens, the atom can become ionized. An ionized atom is when you remove, or in weird cases, add some number of electrons. If you get a large collection of ionized atoms, you basically have a new state of matter called a plasma. A plasma is when you have a whole bunch of atoms with missing electrons, it's basically a charged gas. And it constitutes a fourth state of matter. Either part or all of most stars are in the form of plasma. All right, Andrew, let me know when you've got all that. I got it. I'm gonna race. I still need it. Okay, let me know when you're good, Kiana. Actually, I'm gonna take a screenshot so you can erase it. Are you sure? All right, we are pressed for time, so I would appreciate that actually. Yeah, don't worry, I just took the screenshot. You can erase it now. Well, if everybody else is okay, that is. Everyone else cool? All right. Um, it would be good for us to play a little game called Let's Build an Atom, but I also, uh, we need a couple of formulas um, having to do with light. So I'm going to cheat normally so that you guys have time to digest what we just learned. I've got like a little useful game we can play called Let's Build an Atom. I might want to put that off till next time just so I can squeeze a few formulas in that we need for our homeworks today. It'll make the homework go a little smoother. So let me, let me just kind of jump around and do wacky stuff. Let me talk a little bit about light and I'll come back to this atom stuff later. Uh, I'm erasing. Let's define light. Light actually ends up coming from atoms, so that's the connection between the two, but I'll probably try to make that connection better next time. For now, let me tell you that light is also related to electromagnetism. Light is an electromagnetic wave. And I'm gonna have to kind of define what that means. And I, I wanna use some pictures to do that. I can't remember if flash is still working on my computer. Let me give that a shot. I, I have these cool little flash animations are like some useful um, physics animations. Uh, and I've got one for a charge particle. I know everyone's going to stop using flash. I don't know if attempt to do this. Oh, what the hell? Uh, I don't care. I just want to use this thing. Is anyone good at computers and knows what to do? Oh. If all this little stuff is based in Flash, uh, fuck. Okay. I'm going to have, what are people supposed to do now that Flash is done? 
what's what's like the alternative? We just give up and die. What else can I open this with? Ah, uh, it wants to open it in my browser. All right. Okay. Um, let's just, I got a better idea. Let's look at a picture of an electric field, okay? It would have been cool if it was dynamic, but. Um, this is kind of a weird thought or a weird concept, but how do charged particles talk to each other? Um, how do gravitational objects talk to each other? Like for instance, how does the moon know where the earth is? And how, to, how does the, the moon know where the earth is? Those are kind of awkward questions to ask. Um, oh, geez. I'm having a bad internet day here. The answer is through fields. Uh, I guess this, I would like to make this bigger, but I'll have to. If you have a charged particle like a proton, we kind of imagine that there is this invisible essence of charginess which surrounds the positive charge, and we call it the electric field. Now, you might say to me, hey, Brendan, it sounds like you kind of just made that up. That sounds a little wee-woo, wee-woo. And yeah, at first, people did kind of conceptually think this up, but it turns out that the electric field is real, and you can totally demonstrate that it's a real thing. Hell, you don't got to take my word for it. You can feel the magnetic field yourself by taking two refrigerator magnets. And when you push the two together, <clears throat> you can feel that invisible force between them. And it is kind of like magic. Now, in the case of refrigerator magnets, th oh, this is actually the magnetic field, okay? This is not the electric field, but it turns out that the electric and magnetic fields are almost exactly the same thing. There's like a slight difference between them. And I might get time to talk about that at some point. But for now, the usefulness of the magnetic field is you may have experienced that pushiness and that's what we're talking about there. Obviously, it's hard for us to pick up a proton and an electron, but if we could, we would feel that same invisible force between them. So we imagine that surrounding the proton and surrounding the electron, there's kind of this essence of charginess called the electric field. And when particles interact with each other, like here and the bottom, you can see a proton and electron interacting, here you can see a proton and a proton interacting. We imagine that they talk to each other through the medium of the fields. For instance, when you put a proton next to an electron, you create something called a dipole field, where the field lines connect from proton to electron and that pulls them together. Here's an example of two protons pushing against each other. You can see what's happening is their electric fields are getting pissed off and fighting against each other pushing them away. Now, light is not exactly this field. Light is a ripple or a wave in an electromagnetic field. So the cool animation that I was gonna show you, which would have been really nice for you guys, it actually had a proton with an electric field coming off of it, and you can pick it up and you can wiggle it. And when you wiggle it, you see ripples or waves uh, in the electromagnetic field. And that's a really nice demo. So. I'm going to try to figure it out for next week, how I can view those flash objects. So since I can't show you the animation, why don't I just show you a slide of what a, what a wave of light looks like. Um, in this slideshow over here, I can show you a little model of an electromagnetic wave. This is sort of the one that I was introduced to in a physics class. It shows light as an electromagnetic wave, okay? It has one part of the wave is the uh, electric field. That's what you see in blue. So you can see this wave of electric energy. One part of, the, of light is also a magnetic field. And here's where I may attempt to, to kind of differentiate between electric and magnetic fields. Let's define light as a two-part uh, martini here, okay? So one part, is the electric field. 
And what makes an electric field an electric field is it's associated with static charges, like a proton and an electron that are just fixed and not moving. So the electric field concerns itself with static charges. And one part of the light wave is a magnetic field. And the magnetic field concerns with moving charges. Famously, Albert Einstein was able to demonstrate that the electric and magnetic fields are both aspects of the same exact thing, which is pretty wild. Um, we call it a static, when, when the two things, when the two charges are fixed in space, it's an electric field. When they start zipping around, it turns into a magnetic field. But here's the more important thing. Light is a wave, meaning it's an undulation that travels through space. And waves are at the heart of what physics is all about. Um, there are properties that all waves have that light also has that you need to learn about. This is your first introduction to how light works excuse me, properties of waves. Um, one thing that, that light has as a property is, uh, waves have is a speed. And light always travels at a finite speed, the speed of light, we give it its own letter C, and C has a value of three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Let me tell you about some other properties that waves have. Waves have a wavelength. And we have a funny symbol for wavelength. It's the Greek letter lambda. So it kind of looks like an upside down Y or maybe an X that's missing an arm. Uh, because my board space is limited, I'd like to, oh, by the way, this is kind of cool. Here's a more sophisticated model of light. Here you can see that the waves are represented by little moving arrows. I don't know if I even want to tell you about that, but that's because the electric and magnetic fields are vector fields. That might be a little bit over your pay grade. So I don't know if I want to talk to you like that. Um, let me go ahead and show you some properties of waves instead, because those are easier to digest. So here's a picture of what wavelength looks like. Wavelength is the distance of the repeating pattern of the wave. It goes from crest to crest. But even though this field is invisible, the wavelength is a real physical distance. It's the distance from crest to crest of your wave. So uh, we usually measure wavelength with units of meters. You guys know about those. In today's homework, we're probably going to use a very, very small unit called the nanometer. One nanometer is a billionth of a meter. One times 10 to the minus nine meters. We're going to need that in our homework today. <clears throat> um, draw a little picture of wavelength right next to it. Put a undulating wave, a couple of humps, camel humps here, and represent from crest to crest as the wavelength, if your art skills can handle that. That will define it for you. Oh, Taryn's got the doggy in the house. What's that little guy's name? What's that little guy? Her name is Peppa. Peppa? Pippa. Oh, Pippa, OK. Pippa's cute as hell. Look at that guy. Yeah, we want to see more of him all day long. Or her? Is it a him or a her? It's a girl. OK. Pippa's cool. We like her. OK. Um. Two more properties of waves, and then we'll take a break before uh, our, our homework. Um, wavelength is related to another property that waves have called frequency. Um, frequency, we usually give a little curvy F for. And frequency is the number of cycles that stream past in a second. 
So we define the frequency of a wave as the number of cycles per second of a wave. Now, here's the weird thing. You guys can see that I put cycles in quotation mark. Cycles are more like a conceptual idea. They're not like seconds, which are a hard measurable unit. So because cycles are kind of like the concept of how many waves move past you per second, the actual unit of frequency is a little bit disturbing. It's one over seconds. When we see one over seconds, we're supposed to think cycles per second. Because that's a little bit disturbing, we have decided to rename the units of frequency as hertz. So we define a cycle per second as a hertz, whose abbreviation is HZ. Lastly, light also contains energy. And you guys now know all about energy. Usually we measure energy in joules, but when we measure the energy inside atoms or the energy inside particles of light, we often use a really tiny unit called the electron volt. And here's another unit of energy. I actually should have put this down under units of energy, but I forgot to do it. So let me throw that in now, one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Sorry about that. Let's squish at the bottom here. Um, of, of all these three concepts, wavelength, frequency, and energy, you just had a big chat about energy, so I think you're probably feeling, well, okay about it. Wavelength is pretty easy to understand because it's just a distance. Frequency, I could imagine being a little bit confusing your first time around. So let me demonstrate how I would measure frequency. I would go back to that picture of light that I have. Uh, here's that picture of light that I had. Here we go. OK. So if I were going to measure energy, I would pick a point. Like, let's pick this point, this, this line here. Let's see if I can do this. OK. And now let's see if I can get this thing moving again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of waves that go past the red arrow, or, or how long it takes for the waves to go past the red arrow in one second. So I'll start here. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Okay, so you guys will notice that in one sec, it took five seconds for one wavelength to go past. So I would say that that wave has a frequency of one cycle per every five seconds, which is equivalent to one-fifth hertz. And what is one-fifth, 20%? So the frequency of that wave would be 0.2 hertz because one cycle goes by in five seconds. That's how we think of frequency, okay? Now, before we stop, I need to give you, uh, today's class has at least three problems that measure wavelength and frequency and energy. And so I just need to give you three quick formulas and I'm not even gonna try to use them. I'm just gonna wait till our homework to try them out. But let me get them into your notes uh, so that we can get through our home. This will make our homework go really smooth today. So uh, Andy, uh, Kiana, can I erase this bit down here? Yeah, I got it. I got it. Awesome. Okay, here I go. Last, last little bit, just three formulas. These three formulas can be thought of as the properties, uh, the wave properties of light. And in general, these formulas are usually used for something called photons. Photons are like little individual packets of light. In fact, if I were to make an analogy, I would say that a photon is to light 
as atoms are to matter. We think of matter like we can think of this one kilogram mass as being made of a bunch of atoms. A beam of light contains a whole bunch of little particles of light called photons. OK, here are the properties. Um, I actually have numbers for these formulas because I don't know what their names are. The first formula you're going to need today is the speed of light is the wavelength times the frequency. And once again, remind yourself that the speed of light is a constant three times 10 to the eight meters per second. The second formula gives us the energy of a photon. To measure the energy of a photon, you multiply the frequency by a new magical number. It's actually a constant of nature and it's called Planck's constant. I don't have time to tell you about Planck's constant right now, but it's a magical number that shows up anytime you deal with the microscopic world of atoms and light. Um, and Planck's constant has a fixed value of about seven times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. If we have more time going forward, I'll tell you more cool stories about Planck's constant. Um, this is the speed of light just for completeness sake. Um, this formula is also helpful to relate energy, wavelength, and frequency. Today's class, we're gonna have a third formula, which is like a combination of the two. The energy of a photon can also be calculated in terms of its wavelength. Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. Um, the good thing about these formulas is that they're really easy to use. And some of the stuff I was just talking about will be more understandable once we try some sample problems. So all you need to do is have that in your notes for now, and the rest will become clear as we do it, okay? Trust me on that. Okay, here's the good news, guys. When we do today's homework, it's really easy. It just involves very simple problems with just a little bit of either dimensional analysis or plugging into some wicked simple formulas. Now that I've given you these little bits, it should go quite smooth. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that I've got so many uh, live participants today. Uh, this is great. We got uh, Pippa in the house. That's nice. It, Pippa, was that it? Yeah. That's <laughs> All right, cool. We got Pippa, so that's, that's helpful. Um, should we take a little uh, tea break and then we'll get to it? Well, 15 tea break minute break. sounds nice. Okay, that sounds nice to me too. So it's one, hold on, let's use iPhone time. It's 1.33 iPhone time, so 1.45, 1.48-ish, something like that, okay? I'll try to come back just before 1.50. Okay, Sounds guys, good. see you in a sec. Okay, party peoples, <clears throat> what do you say we make short work of uh, homework number four? <clears throat> Did I miss anything? I just got back. Uh, I don't think so. No, uh, I, I just restarted the uh, the video. Alrighty. <clears throat> um. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Yep. Sorry, guys. Oh, crisis here, but it's been diverted. Um, <clears throat> so let's put our names down. Astronomy 1020 and your section, whatever that is. And um, uh, this is homework number four. Please make sure we turn it in on the homework number four slot. Sometimes people get confused. 
the problem should all be from chapter five. And it looks like, what do we got here today? <clears throat> Where are our, our, okay. Feel free to shout at me if you know what they are. 43, 52, 54, 56, 57. So when I try to go on Blackboard to find that, I don't know if it's just me and I'm having an issue, but I can't seem to find it. Oh, look, it says hidden from students. Oh, okay. I, I apologize. I have no idea why. Can you see it now? Oh yeah, that's why I asked earlier if we had homework or not because I didn't see it. Oh, you know yes, what? Yes, there now. I am so sorry. I've got to unhide these. I can understand now that that would have been confusing. Uh, I have to unhide all of these. Okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, Mariah, do you have the... Uh, the, can you right click and open up the uh, questions for me? Yeah, I have them open. Okay, so why don't you, uh, we'll get to that later. Why don't you read me chapter five, number 43. Okay. It says the atomic terminology practice one. And then it says part A, the most common form of iron has 26 protons and 30 neutrons. State its atomic number, atomic mass number, and number of electrons if it is neutral. So we're looking for the atomic number. We're looking for the mass number. And we're looking for the number of electrons. Okay, Mariah, do you think you can do any of those? I can try. Give me one second. Okay, so the atomic number is 26. Okay. And then the mass number is 30. No, the mass number no. is not the number of neutrons. The mass number is the number of nucleons. Oh, okay, so is that 50? D6. That's right. Great. Nucleons. And then the number of electrons. Um, it's neutral, electrically neutral, right? So does that mean it has 26 as well? That's right. They're balanced. Okay. Great. And that was part A, right? Yeah. That wasn't too hard. No. How about part um, B? Can I go on to part B? Yeah. Okay. So um, consider the following three atoms. Atom one has seven protons and eight neutrons. Atom two has eight protons and seven neutrons. Atom three has eight protons and eight neutrons. Which two are isotopes of the same element? Uh, what was atom two? Atom two has eight protons and seven neutrons. <clears throat> Who knows the answer? Is it atom two and three? Yeah. Same protons, different neutrons.
I'm going to erase part A rather than try to squish part C at the bottom. <coughs> Here I go erasing A. <coughs> When you're ready, Mariah. Okay. Oxygen has the atomic number of eight. How many times must an oxygen atom be ionized to create zero? It has like a plus five um, at the top of it. I don't know how to say that ion. You just say oxygen, <laughs> oxygen plus five or something. Okay, oxygen plus five ion, and then how many electrons are in the are ion in oxygen plus five ion? Is that it? That's easy. How many electrons would oxygen have if it was neutral? Five. No. 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 The atomic number is eight. What does that mean? That. Oh, so would it be eight? Do you have COVID? Oh. <laughs> there's a there's a COVID testing site that opened up right right below my house, and it's pretty chill because you can just walk in like with nothing, no no money, no ID, no anything. You just walk in and they swab and instantly give you the results. So. So that's crazy <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty it's pretty easy and awesome it's like nice like there was literally nobody in there she just walked in they swab your nose and then five minutes later they tell you the result it's so easy it's nice that's, yeah huh. and, and for reference for anyone else out there who needs to know it's um uh it's on the corner of way bossett and dorrance downtown i have one near my house sort of that yeah, some, of the, some places like it's such a big rigmarole to get tested, which is really unhelpful. So I think it's so nice that there are places that open up where you don't need an appointment or an ID. That's the way it should be. You just walk in or money or money. Yeah, it should just be really simple to help everyone figure out where they're at. You know, because I had to go get one. They referred me to this website and the closest one was like at the Paw Sox Stadium. And I was like, Ex I'm not exactly I'm not. like that website, although. I, I don't know. It, there are places opened up that you don't even realize that, are, that some of them are really near you. Like we just happened to find out about that one because we walked by it by accident. We were like, what the hell is, can you just get a test? And they were like, yeah, come on in. It was like so, so cool. <clears throat> That's what we need to like help fight this thing, you know? Uh, okay. What is an oxygen, what does an atomic number of eight mean for oxygen? It means the number of um, protons. Is eight, right? Yeah. So how many electrons would there be if it was electrically neutral? Would it be eight as well? That's right. Yeah, that's be... equal okay, numbers great. of protons and electrons. So if it's an oxygen plus five, that's suggesting it has a net charge of positive five. So how many electrons did it have to lose? I didn't really get what you just said. <laughs> okay. When oxygen is neutral, there are equal numbers of protons and electrons because each electron cancels out a proton and the net charge is zero. This atom does not have a net charge of zero. Its net charge is positive five, right? So let's think, if I remove one electron, it would be positive one, right? because there'd be one more proton than electron. If I ionize or remove two electrons, it would be positive two. And oxygen plus five has been ionized how many times? Is it five? Yeah. And then how many electrons should be remaining in the atom? Is it three? Yeah. I'm too hard about that. All right. 
part of this is just learning how to talk about atoms and understand what we mean by ionized, you know? Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, Amy, do you want to read us problem 54? I'm sorry, whoa, I skipped one. Amy, would you read us problem number 52? Matt, hold on, can I erase this? Yeah, you can erase. Amy, why don't you read us number 52? Uh, 52 is human wattage. A uh, typical adult used about two two thousand five hundred calories of energy each day. Use this fact to calculate the typical adult's average power requirement in watts. Hint: one calorie equals forty one four thousand one eighty four joules. Let's. I know they give us four sig figs. It was four thousand one hundred and what eighty four. Let's just use the number that I gave you in today's lecture. Forty. I rounded that to forty two hundred joules. That's a kilocalorie. Um, <clears throat> one thing I didn't do today, I realized now I covered almost all of these problems, but I did not quite get to power. So here's the quick and dirty about power. The power of an energy using system is defined as the energy. Wow. Is defined as the energy use per unit time. In the MKS system, those have units of joules per second. And we define joules per second as a watt. <clears throat> so everything that you see in brackets here are units. So it's a pretty simple definition. Things that use watts, well, anything that uses energy takes time to use it. For instance, a hairdryer might be 200 watts, right? That means the electricity coursing through the hairdryer is consuming 200 joules every second. <clears throat> um, I have a giant massive guitar amplifier. Well, it's a PA speaker that pumps out 1500 watts, I think. And that's really loud. Uh, 1500 watts is 1,500 joules per second driving those speakers. Blow your damn socks off, let me tell you. Okay, um, a human being consumes close to 2,500 calories a day. Apparently I've already hit about a third of that or so at my pizza this morning. Um, so 2,500 calories a day is a power requirement because it's an energy per unit time. The thing is they want you to basically convert from calories per day to watts. So guess whose job that is, Mateus? Our resident dimensional analysis expert, you. Okay, how should I begin this problem, Mateus? What's right, the first? So we're going we're gonna to do the 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 numbers first, right? You write down the number to convert with its units. So All right, so what... it's going to be two hundred and fifty. No, not two hundred and fifty. Uh, two thousand and five hundred. I'm sorry. Oh, so I should put the units right now? I thought we were just, okay, so calories, calories, right? No, you got to put the whole thing down. Per day? Yes, 2,500 calories per day. Mateus, the first step in dimensional analysis is to write down the number to convert with its units. So you got to write oh, the whole okay. thing. The power All of right. a human being is 2,500 calories per day. What's step two? All right, the division bar. What's step three? And then it's gonna be joules on top. 
And uh, calories per day in the bottom? No, 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 not calories per day. Just calories? Yeah, the per day is already chilling there. Just leave it alone. We're focusing on the calories first. Okay. That way we cancel out calories, right? Mm -hmm. And now our new units are gonna be joules per day. That day just chills for a second. Okay, now give me the numbers. That's step four. All right, so it's going to be uh, 4,200 on top and one in the bottom. Yeah. Now, once we punch that in, Mateus, we will have converted from calories today to joules per day. But we're trying to get mm -hmm. to watts, which is joules per second. So what do I do next? After you get the value from that, you do dimensional analysis to get the from day to uh, seconds. Let's do it all in one stroke here. So I have another division bar. I went back to step two. Now I'm back to step right. three. So it's going to be um, uh, joules per day in the bottom or day in the bottom, no, 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 no. and then hours on top. You can treat these separately. You could do that. You could put. You could try to put joules per day on the bottom, but. It's, it's not as useful. doesn't matter. We're trying mm -hmm. to get to, look, let's think about it a different way, Mateus. I want to end up with joules per second. Since I already have joules on top, just let them chill. Got let's it. Just, let's All right. just chip away at the day part. So we'll do day in the bottom and uh, hours on top? So let's see. Now we have hours per day squared. Is that what you wanted? This is no. Full hours per day squared. Is that what you were trying to get? No. You're assuming that the thing that you want to cancel has to always go on the bottom. But that's not true in this case because the days are on the bottom. I'm just doing it because the joules is eventually the value is going to be on top. That's why I'm putting the days in the bottom because I'm technically I'm 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 taking the the four the four thousand and two hundred is done. <laughs> so <laughs> the days is on top for me right now. Stop, stop, stop. You're thinking like a bad person right now. A bad person tries to deal with numbers. A good person tries to deal with units. Stop being a bad guy, Mateus. Stop trying to talk to me about 4200s and ones and 2500s. I don't give a shit about the numbers. All I give a shit about in step three are the units. When you start thinking with units, then you start thinking with your brain. Here's my problem with your brain. Right now, you were trying to get from joules per day to joules per second and you've made a goddamn mess of things because now I've got two days on the bottom and joules and hours on top, and this is way messier than I wanted. So what's the okay. problem? How do I kill the day? So swap the hour and day, just flip them. That's right. This is how you're supposed to think. You think units first and numbers second. All right, so you wanna go from days to hours. Fine, now Mateus, your days cancel, and now right. you've converted to joules per hour. But I don't think you're done because you need to convert to watts, which is joules per second. So what do I do next? So up next, you're, you're going to put hours on top and minutes on the bottom? Yep. And let's do it one more time. Minutes on top and seconds second in the bottom. Yeah. All right. So hour cancels with hour. And it had to go into the next line, but minutes cancel with minutes. Okay, now you can flop in all your numbers. I know you love the numbers, so give me the numbers. <clears throat> all right, so. So it's gonna be. Ten million. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I don't think you understood me. I need you to put in the conversion factors here. You know those. Oh, by okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So right. it's going to be one day. Uh, one day equals twenty-four hours, and one hour equals sixty minutes. One minute equals sixty seconds. Okay. Now you can punch them up. All right. All in one clean shot. This times this divide by that. Divide by that. Divide by that. <clears throat>
by all means, tell me what you got, guys. Or Matt, Mateus, what did you get? 121.5. Uh, how many sig figs should you be keeping? Uh, three. No. I mean, four. Jeez. How many sig figs does this number have? Three. Nope. Uh, two. Two. The two is meaningful. The five is meaningful. The zeros are not. So round your answer to two sig figs. Uh, 120. That's right. And what are the units? Joules per second. Which, according to the definition up here, what? is the same as 120 watts. Meaning, you basically need to eat enough pizza to be the equivalent of a 100 watt light bulb. That's, or 120 watt light bulb. Your power requirement as a body is similar to that of an Edison light bulb. And that's our answer. Okay, Matthias, we're gonna continue to use your dimensional analysis expertise until this is smooth but you're getting there. Um, we've done two. Andy, I'll have you read uh, number 54 when everyone's ready. Let me know when you're done writing, Andy. You said 54? Yeah. Can I erase everyone? Mateus, wait, hold on. Did, did you have time to get all that down, Mateus? Okay. <laughs> um, uh -oh. On there. Where's no, I'm in the wrong class. You said fifty four. Uh huh. I'm probably on the wrong page. Yeah, there were two pages from what I remember. Two pages. Turn on the second one. Um, 54. Radio station. What is the wavelength of a radio photon from an AM radio station that broadcasts at 120 kilohertz? What is its energy? Is it, is it it's 120 kilohertz? Or uh, yeah. Oh wait, no, 1,120 kilohertz. Okay. You could say 1120 kilohertz if, if you wanted to do it the way you were trying to. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, what did they ask us to do? Um, what is its energy? They also asked us for something else too. What is the wavelength of a radio photon from an AM radio station that broadcasts at one th uh, 1120 hertz? Kilohertz, kilohertz. Kilo okay, hertz. in other words, we have two mini problems here. We have to find the energy and the wavelength. What kind of quantity is kilohertz? Kilohertz is a, um, what, what is that a measurement of? Wavelength? That's not a wavelength, actually. Wavelengths are usually measured in meters or nanometers. What is kilohertz a measure of? Frequency. That's right. So first we have to identify that what they've given us is a frequency. I think they even said it in the text. The frequency of the station is 1120 kilohertz. Let's draw the picture. So let's draw ourselves a radio tower some metal poles and some support structures. We'll put a blinky light on top because they usually put blinky lights on top. And then as we oscillate our current up and down the, the pole, the antenna, a big ass radio wave will come out. And so here's our electromagnetic wave. 
uh, while it's invisible to our eyes, it does carry energy and it has a wavelength and a frequency, which we're going to attempt to calculate. It's going to turn out the wavelengths of radio photons are actually pretty big. And then, you know, over here, we can have our boom box. And it's going to have some antenna and the antenna will pick up the radio wave and from our radio, we'll pump out some corn or some limp biscuit or something. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Here's the first issue. Um, we're going to need those formulas that you learned about today. Uh, one of the formulas is the speed of, sorry. Formula one was the speed of light is wavelength times frequency. And formula two was the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. Those should be the only two formulas that I need to deal with this, although I might want to kind of crisscross them now. So, oops. Here's the issue. When I introduced those formulas today, um, <clears throat> what did I tell you should be the most appropriate unit of frequency in our lecture notes today? Hertz. Hertz. So it turns out that we're going to need to do a conversion from kilohertz to hertz. And for that task, we're going to use our resident expert, Mateus. <laughs> okay, Mateus, let's get down to business. We got to convert to Hertz, okay? That's our first step. We can't really use the formulas until the frequency is in Hertz. So what's my first step, Mateus? 1120 kilohertz. Excellent. Division bar yep. after that. Yep. And then it's going to be Hertz in the bot. No, um, kilohertz in the bottom and hertz on top. Good. Now, I did not actually give you the conversion from it's kilohertz implied. to hertz, but you don't need, no, wait, Mateus, you don't need it. Use the force, meditate on what kilo means. Kilo means a thousand. So, put in the numbers for me. Uh, one hertz equals 1,000 kilohertz. Hold on, wait, that's like, does one meter equal a thousand kilometers? Did you see the analogy there? Yeah. Like a meter is this, but a kilometer is what you use to measure the distance to the store. No, it's a, it, a kilometer is a thousand meters squared. No, 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 it's, 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 no. Forget about the square. One kilometer, a kilometer, right. kilo is equivalent to a thousand. So one kilometer is 1000 meters. Right. You just told me that 1000 you just told me that one hertz is a thousand kilohertz. Yes. No. So one meter equals 1,000 meters, right? So how is, not, wait, how is one hertz not wait, equal to a thousand hertz? Mateus, Mateus, you just said one meter equals 1,000 meters. I'm sorry, one meter, uh, all right. Okay, I might be getting it. Kilo. So kilo is a thousand, right? If yeah. if one regular hertz is just one hertz, why why wouldn't it be a thousand? I I do understand the problem, but I don't understand like how I can solve this. Okay, sure. Let me tell you what you just said to me in numbers or in words. You said one kilohertz. Oh, sorry. You said one. I can't. Now you're confusing me. You said one hertz is equal to a thousand kilohertz. And I don't like that. Does anyone understand why I don't like that? That's not true. It is true that kilo means a thousand, but it is not true that one hertz is a thousand kilohertz. Is it supposed to be flipped? Yes. One kilo. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. That's what I was trying to. I wanted you guys to see it, though, you know? Yeah. If it's one kilohertz, the kilo because turns into the thousand. Obviously, yeah. Okay. So, Mateus, maybe I made that too complicated, but I didn't want to make it too easy. All right. No, you were right. I was way too into it, and I didn't see That's it. That's okay. Um, but now you'll, you won't make that mistake again. So, can you do that in some scientific notation without using a calculator? Um, 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the 6. Yeah, I'm going to keep the 12 in just for fun, because it's already there. 
So right. up to uh, 1.12 million hertz. All right. Now, Matthias or anyone else who thinks they've got this, what formula, let's do the wavelength first. What formula should I use to calculate the wavelength? Uh, Mariah, you seem to have some skills in the math department. If we have- okay, a this is a guessing game with me. All right, well, maybe your guesses are just good. So let's try it. Uh, Mariah, okay. you have a frequency and you want a wavelength, which formula seems to be the best one to use? Um, so I have, okay, so it would be um, two. It would be like the one, the E equals H frequency. But, but E stands for energy. Oh, so it would be one, and then we would have to like change it up, right? Yeah. Do you have the algebra skills to do that? Can you solve this equation for the wavelength? I think so. Wouldn't Why? it be? <laughs> would it be the wavelength equals uh, frequency divided by c? I forgot what c means. Speed of light. But hold on. No, no, no. Let me tell you the mistake that you just made. Okay. So this is a good learning exercise. When you see an equation like this. You want to end up with wavelength on the left hand side. So you just tried to flip the C down to the bottom, but you made the it mistake is. of crossing the equal sign with the wavelength and you didn't flip it. One over the wavelength is F over C. The, the, the problem isn't whether something is on the left or the right. The problem is whether it's something on the top or the bottom. You currently have wavelength on the top. So leave it alone. It's okay to solve for something on the right hand side and flip the frequency down. Oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. All right, so? So it'd be um, C over F. Good. Now the speed of light is a constant. I gave it to you earlier. And yep. three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Now, rather than put in 1.12 million Hertz, I'm gonna remind you guys that a Hertz is equal to a one over seconds. So I'm going to write this as 1.12 million cycles per second, because it'll be better for our dimensional analysis. So that should be a pretty easy job for your calculator. Go ahead and punch it in. Let's keep two sig figs. That's got three. That's got one. I don't know. We'll cheat. Actually, the speed of light is good to three. Actually, we can keep three sig figs. Believe it or not, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight to at least three significant figures. Let me just verify that with you. If we were to type into Mr. Goog speed, oh, wow, I'm dumb. Speed of light. If you round this, seven rounds nine to zero, zero, three. So the speed of light to three sig figs is actually 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So let's keep three sig figs. Okay, give me an answer. Two hundred and fifty um, meters. Two hundred and fifty. Can someone else verify that? I got 260. Oh, no, 270, 270. Yeah, but if we're going to keep three sig figs, we can make it 268 meters, right? It's the same as 270 meters, but we kept three. OK, what about calculating the energy? How many trolls we got in the house today? We're a little short, short of the number of people I like for a, for a live class. Uh, well, I hope the trolls out there are appreciating this. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight trolls. All right. I'll hide the trolls. You guys get my point, right? If, 
I mean, Matea, Sammy, and Mariah, and Andrew are, are interacting with me, so that's cool. That's four. We're close enough to five, I guess. It's just if, the, if no one wants to interact with me and have me pick on them, then why not just watch the pre-recorded ones, you know? <clears throat> Uh, okay, so, uh, but, but, or maybe it's just comforting to know that I'm here while you hide in the dark. I don't know. <laughs> it is very comforting. It is very comforting. Okay, Sabrina. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, what are we going to do about this energy business? We're going to use a second equation. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to have to erase this stuff, um, my beautiful artwork. OK, so the second equation is energy of a photon is Planck's constant times a frequency. Why don't you guys look up the value of Planck's constant from today's lecture notes? That'd be good for you. It's 7 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. Yeah. And I want you guys to know that I rounded that like wicked, wicked hard. If you guys watch the, um, the, the fun TV show, Stranger Things, in the most recent season, you'll remember one of the plot points of the later episodes was that they needed to get Planck's constant to like oh, yeah. six or seven decimal places to unlock the safe. And that cool radio, that radio chick nerd, she was like, oh, I know Planck's constant to, to seven decimal places. So Planck's constant is actually... It, 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 is, it is one of the highest precision numbers that we know in, in physics. Planck's. I mean, I was thinking, man, I teach physics and astronomy. I don't even know Planck's constant memorized to that many spaces. Um, I just round really hard because that's how astronomers do it. Um, 6.62607015. So there it is to one, two, three, four, five, six, nine decimal places. But notice how hard I rounded it. I just rounded it to seven, just whatever. All right. Um, if we wanted to keep three sig figs, though, it's, I wish I hadn't closed that. It was 6.62. Maybe today we'll just keep six. Oh, sorry. 6.63. Why don't we do a little bit of extra precision in honor of stranger things? Okay. So we'll do 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And that's just because we had three sig figs for our frequency here. Our frequency is 1.12 million hertz, or 1.12 million cycles per second. So punch that up for me. By the way, being a physics geek and being into radio stations, they kind of go hand in hand. A lot of like ham radio operators, it used to be like a cool hobby. What'd you get, Mateus? Just read it for me. Could you just sum summarize it? Three sig figs, buddy. 7.42 times 10 to the negative 28. 7.42 times 10 to the minus 28. And the units? Jules. Excellent, because it's an energy. I just had a quick question. Yeah. So I got 7.425. Would we round that up to to 4.3? Or I don't know if anybody else got that, but. Yeah, we should. Shame on you, Mateus. We have to round that to 4.3. OK, <laughs> Mateus. Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out, Mateus. I really no, didn't mean it. I deserve it. Because there's going to be a lot of people watching this video later who would, many of them will be confused in that point. We have to get into the habit of good rounding. Um, the moral of this story is that a single photon of radio light, a radio light particle, is really long. 300 meters is like, that's probably longer than a, than a jumbo jet. But its energy is very, very low. We tend to think that all wavelengths of light, light is microscopic and tiny. That's certainly true about visible light, but not radio waves. What's the, let's just look up here the length of a 747 jumbo jet. I wonder if they'll give it to me. What? Meters. Wow. A jumbo jet is about 76 meters. 
So this radio photon is like, what, maybe like six jumbo jets long or something. That's crazy. Radio waves are really, really long wavelength. That's one of the reasons they can pass through the walls of your house and, and your bodies without interfering with any of the atoms. Longer the wavelength of light, the easier it kind of passes through substances. All right, I need to erase. Is everyone good here? These problems are going to go real quick now because you guys are getting the swing of it. Um, uh, uh, so Andy read that one. Who did any, Mateus, have you read one yet? I can't remember. All right, Mateus, can you read us number 56? Yes, so X-ray photon. What is the wavelength of an X-ray photon with energy 10? We say is that this... as kilo electron volts. Sometimes people just say KEV. Oh, okay. Kilo and electron volts. Um, volts. In parentheses, 10,000. I'm sorry? Uh, volt, volts. Like a voltage. Volts. Volt. All right. So uh, 10. Thousand electron votes. Notice, Mateus, they converted the kilo right into a thousand, so we wouldn't screw that up, right? Okay. Nice. And what is its frequency? And it's uh, doing, I think it has a uh, converting factor here. One electron votes equals 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joule. You'll remember I gave that to you at some point in our lecture today uh, as an afterthought. So. We'll write it down again. OK, you can see that they're implying that we're going to have to do a unit conversion. But first, let's look at our three formulas again. Formula one is the speed of light is wavelength times frequency. Formula two is the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times frequency. And there's a third formula also for the energy of a photon, which is the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. Uh, first, we got to convert our energy to MKS units. Because these formulas all, uh, they all require MKS units. So guess whose job that is, Mateus? <laughs> All right, Mateus is up. Help me convert 10,000 electron volts into joules. All right, so it's going to be 10,000 electron volts. Uh huh. And the dividing bar. Uh huh. And it's going to be electron volts on the bottom. Yep. And uh, we're converting it to joules, right? Yeah, joules on top. Okay. Now use your conversion. And one electron vote is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. Well, one in the bottom and yeah. um, 1.60 times. I was just going to ask that. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Right. I left the zero out for space reasons. So, uh, Mateus. What would 10,000 be as a power of 10? That's 10 to the power of? Uh, 10 to the power of three? I see four, four zeros there. Four. 10 to the power of four, because there's one, two, three, four zeros. Mm -hmm. That means um, you can just add four zeros to negative 19. So, so will be one point six zero times 10 to what power? 10 to the negative 15. And that's joules, good. Okay. So now we have our 10,000 electron volts converted to joules. Let's deal with the wavelength first. Which of our three formulas will be most beneficial for getting the wavelength? The first one? That gives you wavelength in terms of frequency. The speed of light is known, but we don't know what the frequency is yet. We were just given the energy. So this is not- Oh, helpful. is it two? Two gives us the frequency in terms of the energy. That will be useful for this part here. 
but I want to tackle the wavelength first. All right, so probably three. Yeah, because H and C are constants of nature. They always stay the same. Thus, this formula is relating energy to wavelength. And we have the energy, but we don't have the wavelength. Let's get our resident algebra expert, Mariah, to help us solve for wavelength. I was just doing this in my head. OK, so tell us. OK. What Remember, Mariah, flipping an equation is the same as flipping a burger. You just need to know one thing about flipping a burger. If the grilled side is down, you have to flip it to the uncooked side, right? Anytime you cross that equal sign, you've got to flip the variables. So flip things around until you have wavelength on one side. So I can keep the wavelength on the right and then just... Ah, ta, 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 ta. Hold on. I can't. In the, in the previous problem, you could keep the wavelength on the right because the wavelength was in the top. And so that's cool because you'll end up with oh. ba, ba, ba equals wavelength. But here, wavelength is not on the top. So if you keep it on the right, you're going to be solving for one over wavelength. And that's just going to be awkward, you know? Got it. Do you want me to go with it step by step in my head or just try to figure it out? Go step by step in your head. That'd be helpful for the listeners. OK, so it'd be E times wavelength then yeah. equals H times C. Sorry, my dogs are barking. That's OK. So in other words, you basically took the wavelength, right? Yeah, exactly, right there. And then I would divide by E. So the E will then go down there. Yeah. And that will give us, sorry, wavelength is equal to H times C over E, right? Guys, I kind of I hate writing at the bottom of the board because I can't I can't have good handwriting because my arm is crunched. So I'm just gonna erase and slide everything up top if that's okay with y'all. Okay. Don't forget those numbers on me now. All right. So we had just gotten H times C over E is the wavelength, and now we're gonna substitute in the numbers. Why don't I have you guys read the numbers to me? Because I think that might actually be good for you. So let's get the Planck's constant. Uh, you can go back to the, the one sig fig value if you'd like. So it's seven times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. Uh, no, Planck's constant is not joules per second. That's a lot. It's joules times seconds. OK, yeah. And then it's times 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's the speed of light. And now we want to put the energy in MKS units. What was our energy in MKS? One point six zero times ten to the negative fifteen. And that's joules. Punch them up. Uh, you watching guys, did you get a number? That should be pretty simple, right? Uh, why don't you just read it to me, Mateus? I trust you guys now, kind of, sort of, slash, not really. 1.31 times 10 to the minus 10. I'm just going to go with 1.3 because, you know, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 10. And the units? Um, meters per second. Careful. 
Try again. Meters per second squared? No, no, no. Joules cancel with joules. This second is the top of the top. This oh, is the I bottom get it. So of the top. Meters second, uh, meters to the second. Where are you getting the two meters from? I only see one meter. Oh, wait, just meters. Yeah, wavelength is a distance. It's measured in meters. How many nanometers is that? A nano is 10 to the minus nine. So if you slide the decimal point back one, that's 0.13 nanometers. I'm not gonna do the dimensional analysis because whatever. <clears throat> All right, now let's get the energy. Which formula do I want for, wait, no, sorry. We have the energy. They wanted the wavelength and they wanted the frequency. What formula do I want for frequency, Mariah? You want C equals wavelength times frequency. Okay, you could do that, Mariah, because we have the wavelength. But I would suggest that we use formula number two. Why? Because they gave us the energy and I'd rather go from the given to the new variable. That's a subtle thing. I don't know if I want to explain that, but. No, I get it, I get it. Okay, uh, let's use E equals H times F. Okay, Mariah, why don't you help us solve for frequency now? So you would divide the left side by H, leaving frequency equals E divided by H. Nice, now you're getting it. All right. Um, so our MKS value was I think 1.5 six times 10 to the minus 15 joules. And our H from up here is seven times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. And what's that leave us with? Punch them up. That's an S, by the way. That's, that's not looking so good. I should have wiped this board down before I did the whole bunch. It's looking a little icky. Is it 2.3 times 10 to the 14 seconds? Not seconds, because seconds is not on the top. All right, hold on, wait. So what was your number again, Mateus? I forgot the number already. 2.3 times 10 to the 14. Now let's work on those units a little bit more. I agree that joules cancel out. But I do not agree that that is seconds. Why not? Oh, so it's frequency, so it's cycle per second? Yes. Yeah, sec in other words, the seconds are on the bottom, and that's actually meaningful. This is per second, or as you said, cycles per second. And cycles per second are equivalent to hertz. So we could say that this is 2.3 times 10 to the 14 cycles per second, or 2.3 times 10 to the 14 hertz, either way. So those are our final answers. And that means we have one left to go. I have another, another, I don't know, I have a question, I guess. So I have 2.3 to the 18th on mine. I don't know if that's everybody's calculator. I don't know if you could see that. Um, I that too. Oh, you did? So is it possible? <gasps> oh, sorry. Um, Bless you. Uh, 1.6 EXP negative 15 divided by 7 EXP negative 34. The 18 is right. I messed okay. up. That's okay. That's why we should all be punching so that we can catch those little mistakes. So thanks, guys.
Uh, let me get a tissue. Hold on. Uh, I just want to Windex this bad boy down. If you don't clean this board, it, it really kills the, uh, the the markers. And you know, now that I'm teaching from home, I have to pay for those markers, so it's kind of annoying. <laughs> oh shoot! I erased the. Uh, well, do you guys have the number there? It was number 57, the next one. Okay. Um, do you have that ready to go? Whoever was talking there? I don't really yeah, I have it. it. All right, so hold on. Uh, ouch. My copy of the Arabian Nights is getting covered in ick in this, okay? Can't have that. I want to read the tales of Sinbad and the Seven Seas, okay? Oh, wait, so this is chapter five. What did you say again? 57. Okay, what's the title? How many photons? Okay. Suppose that all the energy from a 100 watt light bulb came in the form of photons with wavelength 600 nanometers. Is that how I say it? Yeah, and um, that is right. That's nanometers. Let me just show okay. you something. I want you guys, when you're hearing this problem, to have like, to have the good thoughts. We kind of had to pause in an awkward place today because I, I kind of gave you little tidbits and it didn't quite make a full tapestry yet. But uh, in our classes next week, you guys are going to learn all about like the visible wavelengths of light. And um, we usually use nanometers to measure light. And, um, Wavelength kind of corresponds to color. In this problem, all of the photons that are coming from this bulb are 600 nanometers. So this is kind of like the equivalent of an orange port party bulb that you would see at like uh, in the lighting section at Home Depot. Sorry, I got to get out of here. Uh, like if you if you've ever gone to Home Depot, you can see like uh, party party bulbs. And they come in different, well, now they're all kinds of crazy, right? But uh, it used to be like, you could just get like an, oh, here we go. Here's an orange party bulb. Now, in reality, this orange party light probably doesn't give off a pure wavelength of orange. I bet this glass filter lets out a range of wavelengths that are centered around orange. But if, if you could narrow the paint filter so that it only let out 600 nanometers, it would be a very, very pure orange, like a laser. This is almost like an orange laser party bulb, okay? So all the light coming from this bulb is in the form of photons whose wavelength is 600 nanometers. So they've given us two things here. They've told us the power of the bulb is 100 watts. And I'd like to remind the class, because we didn't talk too much about power, that 100 watts is the same thing as saying 100 joules per second. You just kind of learned that a few moments ago. And they also gave us the wavelength of the photons, which is 600 nanometers. I'll remind the class that a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Sorry, my board's getting the shakies here. I don't know if this one out. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, Mariah Key or whoever was reading, keep going. Who wait, who's reading? Sorry, I forgot I was still muted. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, it says in parentheses, note in reality, light bulbs distribute energy over many wavelengths. 
And this is part A. Calculate the energy of a single photon with wavelength 60, uh, sorry, 600 nanometers. Okay, so what do you think I should do based on what we learned in the previous couple of problems? I've got one photon of orange light with a wavelength of 600 nanometers, and I want to know the energy contained in one photon. So what would be a good formula to choose based on the ones that we've been using? See if you guys can sniff it out. It'd be E equals H times C over wavelength. Yeah, because that gives us the energy in terms of the wavelength. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, we probably need to convert from nanometers into meters because this is an MKS formula. So, Mateus, here's 600 nanometers. What do you want me to do? Division bar? Yep. And then it's going to be uh, nanometers in the bottom and meters on top. And what's the conversion factor? Uh, one nanometer equals one times 10 to the negative nine meters. I'm just going to, I just wrote 10 to the minus nine for fun. So can you do that in your head? Uh, just leave it as 600. Wait, I'm sorry. What did you say? I just want you to glue this to that. I don't want you to think. Got it. All right. So it's going to be. Wait one second. Um, Nanometers. I'm sorry. I'm really. I, I think you're right. So, I don't think you understand how easy it, what I want you to do is. I just wanted you to say 600 times 10 to the minus nine meters. Oh, OK. Right. I'm just. Yes. It's the same thing, right? So over here, I'm going to do Planck's constant. Um, 7 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds multiplied by the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Sorry, I'm getting a little squishy up here. Divided by 600 billion of, of a negative nine. Oops, sorry? sorry. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Punch him up. I apologize. I'm kind of smushing these things together. It's never good to do that. I got 3.5 times 10 to the 19th joules. Um, positive 19 sounds like a pretty big energy for one meter. Oh, no, negative 19. All right. OK, tell me about part B. Um, how many 600 nanometer photons would have to be emitted each second to account for all the light from this 100 wall light bulb? We're trying to find the number of photons emitted per second. Now, the power tells us the total number of joules coming out per second. 100 joules, but one single photon only contains a wicked tiny number of joules, 10 to the minus 19 joules or so. So if we want to go from, we know how much energy is coming out per unit time, and we want to turn that into particles of light per unit time, we have to divide the total energy by the energy of one particle of light. In other words, we want to do 
100 joules per second. And we want to convert joules into some number of photons. This will cancel out the joules and leave us with photons. In the previous problem, we found that one 600 nanometer photon is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So why don't you guys punch that up for me? I got 2.9 times 10 to the 20th. Let's, let's do a bold round here so that we don't miss the point. Two, three, so three times 10 to the 20th. Yep, and the units here. Photons, seconds. Uh, it's per second, but it's number of photons per second. Now, I don't know if you guys appreciate what a number like three times 10 to the 20th photons per second means, but as a way of demonstrating just how preposterously stupid that number is, let's start by typing in the age of the universe. We actually have a pretty good sense of how old the universe is by studying light from the Big Bang. It's about 13.8 billion years old. Suppose I were to convert 13.8 billion years to seconds. That would be four times 10 to the 17 seconds. Now, I don't know if you can understand what I'm trying to say here, but the number of little orange photons coming out of a 100 light watt light bulb in one second, there are a thousand times more photons leaving that bulb per second than there are seconds since the beginning of the Big Bang. That number is wacky big. That's a three followed by 20 zeros. Let's take a look at question number C. C says, based on your answer to part B, explain why we don't notice the particle nature of light in our everyday lives. Another way to say this question is, why can't I see one photon? Why don't you guys suggest some reasons for why I might not be able to see one photon of light? Um, it's small. I agree. So let's take these in turn. I agree, Andrew, that 600 nanometers is a pretty small number. On the other hand, Andrew, I also know from my lecture today that all orange light has a wavelength of 600 nanometers. So in other words, if 600 nanometer light was too small to see, I wouldn't be able to see anything orange because all orange light is 600 nanometers. So too small is not good enough. How about another guess? Why can't I see one single photon? It's too fast. I agree that the speed of light is the fastest speed known to science. Three times 10 to the eighth meters per second is the absolute maximum speed anything can travel. And yet, all light travels at three times 10 to the eight meters per second. That's a rule. Every single color of light, they all have the same speed. Mariah, if light was too fast to see, I wouldn't be able to see any light because it's all traveling at the same speed. You see what I mean? We still see light despite it being fast. It doesn't matter if there's a lot of it or a little of it. So too fast will not work either. 
Let's have another guess. I think I have one. Okay, I'd like to hear it. So you know how 600 equals like orange? Maybe because it's one, it doesn't give off anything? Well, it, hold on a second. That might be a little too vague for me, Kiana. A single wiggle, a, a photon of light would be a single, a single 600 nanometer photon. Even if it's one photon, it still has a wavelength of 600 nanometers. Now, the mm. problem with your statement is when you said give off everything, is a, it's a little vague because this is a little particle of light that contains some energy. And we're trying to figure out why we can't detect it with our eyeballs. So I don't totally like your answer because it, it's just a little too vague. I liked these answers better because they focused on a physical property. Let's talk about the size of its wavelength. That turns out to not work. Let's talk about its speed. That doesn't work. What might be another reason why? Oh, too many. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I was thinking it was too big, but... <laughs> well, when you say it's too big, you when I say it, I assume you're talking about one photon. It mm -hmm. is not big if it's 600 mm -hmm. nanometers. Mm -hmm. However, I think what you meant to say was there's a large number of photons coming out per second. Here's the problem with that answer. When you go to the beach there's probably mm -hmm. close to 10 to the 20 grains of sand on a single mm -hmm. beach. And yet you all know that if you go to the beach, even though there's too many grains of sand, you can pick up a pile of sand in your hand and you can see the individual grains. So just because there's too many of a thing doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to see an individual unit. That unfortunately is an issue of size and here size doesn't work. So we've ruled out, it's not that they're too small, although they are small. It's not that they're too fast, although they are fast. And it's not that they're too many, although there are too many of them. The reason you can't see one photon is about some other property of the light. <clears throat> The way it reflects off of things or something? Mm -mm, not that. What if you had the world's tiniest? Right. Oh, yeah? I think I, think I got it. There's if, not like enough energy. That's right. You need a minimum quantity of energy for your eyeball to be stimulated. When you're pumping out 10 to the 20 photons per second, a big gob of them can hit you, your eye and deliver enough joules to stimulate your eye. It's kind of similar to how like mosquitoes can sometimes land on your skin so delicately, so lightly that, that they don't trigger the minimum threshold of, of, to, to, to feel it on your skin. Your eye needs a minimum amount of energy. It's all about the property of energy. So the answer is there is not enough energy in one photon to stimulate your eye. There is not enough, it's all about energy. Sorry about my handwriting there. That makes sense. Yep. So what, what the cool thing about this problem is we're learning to think sometimes in terms of energy. It's very easy for us to think in terms of number and speed and size, but we want to start thinking about energy. Okay, cool. So that wraps up today's homework. Let's see how we did on time. Uh, 306, not the worst ever. It's, it's tough to squeeze it into a, uh, an hour and a half, but we try. All right. Um, I'm gonna now stop the video because presumably the people watching later will have gotten enough. I'll give them one last quick look. Okay.
They can always pause it there if they're missing something. And uh, we'll resume on Thursday. I'm oh, sorry, today's Thursday. We'll resume next Tuesday.